So take any chemical reaction. It could be one in which a chemist is trying to increase the amount of product that they're producing, or to produce it at a faster rate. Or it could be an industrial process where they're trying to maximize the yield so that they can maximize the amount of return that they're going to get for their particular process. Either way, we're looking at something in which somebody is trying to manipulate a chemical reaction. That is, they're trying to speed up the rate of the chemical reaction. So what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to start playing around with the amount of reactants that they have going into that particular reaction. But are they just going to start trying to amp up the amount of reactants or maybe try and change the temperature without knowing the direct impact? Probably not, or else I wouldn't be making this video. So there's got to be some way for us to figure out what impact changing the temperature is going to have or changing the concentration is going to have on the rate. If we use this as our general equation, we can see that we have two reactants forming products. Now we're not going to consider products here because if we're looking at the initial concentrations of these reactants, the products haven't formed yet. You will notice if we look at how the rate law is represented that the coefficients, lowercase a and lowercase b, don't appear anywhere in this rate law. And that is important. Those coefficients are not part of the rate law. So don't ever get confused and try and squeeze them into the rate law because they just do not play a role. If we look at the variables that we have in this rate law, we can see that the square brackets always denote moles per liter and that we have the concentration of both of our reactants in there, A and B. Now, if there was a C and a D, those concentrations would also be considered in our rate law. So our rate law is as long as the number of reactants that we have in our particular reaction. The exponents that you see there, the M and the N in this case, are what we refer to as the rate law exponents, and they represent the order of these reactants. And the order just refers to the effect that a change in concentration is going to have on the overall rate. And we'll get to order in just a second. But I want to focus a little bit on K, because K is referred to as the rate law constant. And obviously that constant is going to be different for various reactions. The other thing that's important about K is that it's temperature dependent. That means that K is going to vary depending on the temperature of that overall reaction. If the temperature goes up, K will also go up. If the temperature goes down, K will also go down. So K is going to be dependent on the temperature of that particular reaction. So we don't want to change the temperature, that is we want to hold it constant when we're trying to evaluate K through various experimental trials. And it's important to note that the order and then ultimately the value for K is dependent on experimental data. That is, as you've noticed, we can't use the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation, nor can we use our opal stoichiometry to help us figure out the overall orders of these particular reactants. We have to use experimental data. Now that brings us to the units for K. The units for K are dependent on the individual orders of the reactants, and ultimately the overall order of the reaction. So we can't derive the values for K until we've gone through and assessed and evaluated all of the experimental and empirical evidence. Now what about order? Well, in order for us to establish order, we have to, as I said, evaluate these things experimentally, and we have to use the empirical data. Now the method that we use to do this is something called the initial rates method. And really what we're doing is just taking different concentrations of the reactants and measuring a short amount of time between the initial concentration and some endpoint. So we change the concentration and see how quickly or slowly the rate goes after changing that. And what we do is we evaluate the initial concentrations that we started with and therefore we refer to this as the initial rates method. Now these orders that are derived from our experimental data, what they do is they give us a relationship between the concentration of the reactants and the overall rate of the reaction. If we have something that we refer to as zero order, zero order means that the concentration or a change in concentration is going to have effectively no change in the rate of the reaction. So even if we were to double or triple or quadruple the overall concentration of that particular reactant, if it's zero order, it's not going to have any effect on rate. If we have something, however, that's first order, that's a direct relationship between the concentration and the rate. So if something is doubled in terms of its concentration, we will notice a doubling in the rate as well. And when we get into something that is second order, we now raise any change in concentration to the power of 2, or we square it. 
so that if we were to double the concentration, we would get a quadrupling in the overall rate. So here we have an example in which we have three reactants. Now, we have the coefficients represented by the lowercase values, and of course, we're not considering the concentration of the products just yet, because if we're using initial rates, there are no products right now. So if we take a look at this, we establish experimentally that the following orders are true, that A has an order of 1, B has an order of 2, and C has an order of 0. And the way that we communicate this is we say that for this particular reaction, it is first order with respect to A, second order with respect to B, and zero order with respect to C. So when we derive the rate law, and we write out the rate law, we have rate is equal to K, the rate constant, times the concentration of A to the power of 1, times the concentration of B to the power of 2, and times the concentration of C to the power of 0. Now, anything raised to the exponent 0 is going to be 1, so we can also shorten it and just leave C right out of the equation. Well, let's take a look at what the overall order of this reaction would be then. Well, if we know that the individual orders are 1, 2, and 0 respectively, the overall order of the reaction is going to be the sum of all of those individual orders. So for our particular reaction, what we have here is an overall order of 1 plus 2 equaling 3. Of course, 0 doesn't play a role in there. So what this means is that the overall order of this reaction is 3. But what does that mean to us? Well, anything that we do to the concentrations of our reactants now, in order for us to figure out rate, can be raised to the power of 3. So if we were to double all of the concentrations of the reactants, we would get a doubling to the power of 3, or an increase in the rate by a factor of 8. Now, where do we go from here? Well, from here what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how we can use experimental evidence, that is empirical data, to come up with the appropriate rate law expression for a particular reaction. That is, we're going to empirically derive the exponents or orders of the individual reactants. And then once we do that, we can put all of that information into the rate law and we can start to establish what the value for k is going to be. But we're going to leave that for another time. Thanks for watching.